Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, Monty, for the nice introduction. And thank you, obviously, uh, everyone for being here. Thank you also, Paula, that uh, putting me as a second slot allowed me to sleep more. And uh, let me go uh, ahead and talk about uh, uh, <clears throat> beyond the vehicles and other flow systems. So the idea is that uh, give a broad view on other systems that have uh, some relationships with uh, um, traffic systems. And uh, the attention will be really on the math models and uh, scales and phenomenology. So I prepared a lot of slides, guys, but uh, I, I do like the fact that these sessions are so in interactive and everyone is intervening and stopping. So I, if I present half of the slides I prepared, I would be extremely happy. So please go ahead and stop me anytime you think uh, there is uh, something that could uh, uh, be clarified. So let me start just recalling something that you already heard many times during uh, these two weeks, uh, that in modeling of vehicle traffic, we have at least uh, two scales that are uh, most used. Uh, one is the microscopic one. We are looking car by car, as just Paula reminded us. We put a system of reference, and so the state of the system is uh, uh, just given by assigning, for instance, position and speed of every car. And uh, these models are usually called microscopic because you are looking microscopically at car by car. And there are obviously a wealth of models, many we're discussing these days. Uh, um, you know, a few of them like the follow the leader can be expressed by giving uh, an evolution equation for the speed of each car. In this uh, case, you see the derivative of the speed relates to the difference in speed with the car ahead and uh, the headway, that is the distance between next car and the car under consideration. Uh, the opposite scale, well, I guess you can imagine also other scales, but surely the opposite scale among the most traditional one is the macroscopic, uh, where you imagine to look at the uh, road from, uh, say, very far away, like with the helicopter or even satellite, and then you we cannot really distinguish the position of every car, but rather a density. So you're going to have a functional row that depends on time and space that indicates the amount of car that are present in, at that time in that position in space. So if we do like that, as Paula reminded, we can indeed just using conservation of the number of cars to write PD equations. Uh, I, I will repeat just quickly because Paula did even the two-dimensional uh, picture. So here you take uh, two uh, points in the road. You write uh, the derivative of the integral. That means how the number of cars between A and B changes. And this is given by the flux in A, cars are entering, minus the flux in B, cars are exiting. Fundamental theorem of calculus, a little bit of algebra, and then you end up with this that is uh, the well known uh, conservation law. Now, the LWR model amounts to recognize that uh, the flux F is uh, density times speed, and assuming that speed depends just on density, so closing the relation as first order. Uh, these are the uh, two kind of opposite scales and you know there are quite a bit of scales in between and uh, there are also multi-scales approaches but uh, let's uh, uh, think about uh, other systems that uh, share some uh, common feature with this one there are many of them and uh, here are just a few examples obviously animal groups so there are uh, uh, a lot of agents usually this is called multi-agent exactly because there is a high number and sometimes it's called social dynamics uh, to stress the fact that the way in which interaction occurs is not just like for inert matter or gas dynamics depending on physical laws, but there are other laws that are involved into that. And some are called social. Uh, so social networks obviously is part of that, even if usually you don't care about the space location, it's more like interaction in the virtual space. Crowd dynamics is definitely very similar to animal groups. The main difference is that crowds uh, of pedestrians move in 2D, while animal groups could, could move anywhere from 1D one one less traffic, 2 or 3Ds. 
I put their metabolic network and that's maybe open for discussion, but one may think that indeed the metabolic networks, you have some kind of uh, outside intelligence, mainly the DNA, I would say, but not only that because epigenetics and other species thought had otherwise that uh, regulates all these very complicated interactions. And there is a, some kind of choice of agents because by protein folding, uh, uh, a, a single molecule can play different uh, uh, roles uh, biologically. Anyway, for sure, in all these systems, there are uh, a lot of agents. They are somehow intelligent in the sense that they are not inner matter, but uh, many of them take decision and they have complicated interaction among them. So uh, let me make a, immediately some example of widely used models on in some of these uh, example we um, Showed here, one of the most famous is the Exelman-Krause. This is a model for opinion dynamics. So every agent has a value that is uh, not a representative position in space, but rather an opinion. So I don't know, you can bound your agents between zero and one, and they can have an opinion regarding a very specific uh, issue. Then the agents will interact uh, by, well, convincing each other of their opinion. So you see there is a term here, xj minus xi, that means if I, if I imagine I am attracted to the opinion of the agent j. But then there is this important term uh, that the interaction occurs only if uh, uh, the opinions are sufficiently close enough. This is called the bounded confidence model. So bounded confidence, because I'm not, not gonna interact with people that, that thinks extremely different from me, but rather with people that are close to my opinion. So that's the main idea. This model was very celebrated and uh, you know, transformed and studied in many ways. One of the main phenomenon is the so-called clustering. If you start in R, here is represented between zero and 10, with a lot of agents, they will start interacting and then they will separate in uh, uh, different clusters. And at the end, they all will coalesce to one of these clusters. So you see, it's, a, it's a, an extreme uh, strong effect. In case in which they would all uh, get together, you would call it a consensus. And also consensus models are very popular. Another model that was, was very influential, especially in the applied math community, is the Cochrane's mail one. That is, you see, also reasonably recent, 2007. So in this case, uh, the model uh, describes uh, alignment. So uh, what does it mean? Well, it, it's similar to traffic. In follow the leader, we expect uh, drivers uh, to tend to drive at the same speed by interaction. And something similar happens here. We have our, our agent. They may move on a line in space, uh, two, 3D, whatever. And then their speed aligns. And you see, this is an alignment term. The speed will tend to get close one to each other, but the strength of the interaction depends on the distance. So closer agents will tend to align more and far away agents will tend to align, yes. The final effect we expect is exactly that. So the agent will be displaced in space, maybe even far away sometimes, but they will tend to have all the same speed. Other models, well, as you can imagine, these models uh, could be used uh, for birds that are flying in space, and indeed they were used. Um, some engineers like Naomi Leonard interacted with uh, physicists and biologists, and they designed models exactly for migration. Um, they modified the second equation. Uh, the meaning is the following. You have two pieces here. One piece is again the alignment. I try to align with my uh, mates because in migration, you know, we want to stay together, but it could be also for mating purposes, for escaping predators or for food seeking. And there is another term that tells me there is uh, a kind of uh, uh, given a priori speed that I'm, or direction that I'm going to follow. They saw that, you know, birds that are migrating follow sometimes the magnetic, the terrestrial magnetic field. Sometimes they look at uh, um, the space where they are traveling. So they have some uh, cues by which they can identify a given speed. So essentially this uh, model uh, mixes the idea that you want to travel in a given direction or with a, end with a given speed and the fact that we, you will interact with your 
group mates. And uh, let me mention just one other model that we design. Uh, it's essentially a consensus model on the sphere, or if you want, Axelman Krause type. And uh, what is funny here is that we had a lot of fun in, uh, in uh, creating uh, strange dynamics. So you can create consensus, so you can create uh, clustering, but you also have uh, other type of behavior that we call dense in equilibria, in which, for instance, all these agents placed on a sphere are rigidly moving one with respect to each other, but the whole system is rotating. So that's obviously very far from being exhaustive. It's just uh, some example of uh, uh, systems that are called, uh, broadly speaking, social dynamics. Again, many times uh, the way in which the system is designed depends on the application. So the XML and Krause really was referring, uh, was focusing mostly on opinion dynamics. Kakore's mail, uh, interesting enough, uh, was designed first uh, to talk about the linguistic evolution, how languages uh, evolve. Uh, but it was very much then interpreted for birds flocking. Flocking means aligning their velocity and go together. And uh, also uh, sometimes in engineering for uh, um, formation of uh, um, aircraft formation or other type of robotic formation. Um, let me just uh, again give a, a brief uh, idea of uh, uh, this field by doing something that, you know, this type of graphs, I think now they are very popular. So I tried to create one in which there are a lot of the buzzwords that you find in this field and uh, two feet representing pedestrian dynamic because is one of the of those fields in which I work more. So some of the buzzwords relate uh, to what you would expect a whole group to do. And uh, really a key word is self-organization. So self-organization is essentially the idea that even with the simple interaction rules among agents, you can get a lot of interesting group formation. So well, we have a quick question from Sharon here. I'm just- uh, Sure. Uh, Go ahead, Sharon. Thank you, sorry for interruption. So in your previous slides, can you uh, describe the rationale using the uh, sphere for, for the opinion dynamics? Because I feel like uh, intuitively it should be for um, on a network, but the way it's on a sphere here. Oh yeah, yeah. There are a lot of models of networks and many of them indeed started to mimic in the famous Ising model, right? For ferromagnetic uh, material. Uh, but you are gonna find uh, uh, indeed uh, models essentially on, on any space you can imagine. Now network, it depends what you mean exactly by network, but uh, uh, there are two different things here, right? One is the state space in which evolve. And it should represent some physical quantities, like for birds is uh, the space where you travel. For opinion should be some space that represent your opinion. And one other thing is the network in the sense of the interaction network. So for instance, in the Excelman krause model, you will interact with whoever is close enough to you. So you will not interact on a fixed network of agents, but you will interact with the time evolving network. So two different concepts here, right? The state space in which you evolve, and in the case of the sphere model, your opinion would be in the sphere. And another thing is the network on which you interact. So that means the agent with which you interact. Sometimes people prescribe fixed interaction networks, sometimes evolving one. Again, in the, in the Excelman Krause, maybe I can go back, you saw that one phenomenon was agents clustering. So these agents will interact initially with each other. The interaction network here is gonna be very dense. But then as they polarize, all these agents that collapse here will interact just among them and will not interact anymore with these agents. So the network is evolving in time. Am I answering to your question? Uh, so, yeah, uh, I understand a part you mentioned that because the interaction can be evolving or complex, but how can Sphere describe this complexity? Uh, yeah, so the Sphere is going to represent not the interaction network, but the physical space in which your opinion evolved. The idea there was uh, look for a space that was compact, 
because uh, your opinion probably doesn't yet diverge. Well, let's not enter into details of that. And uh, so it was natural to assume the sphere would be like uh, you have, a, for instance, uh, more than one issue on which you are looking your opinion, corresponding, for instance, on the three axes. And uh, you assume that you cannot be completely neutral. So on everything, that would be like lying inside the sphere. That would be one of the potential reasoning. And the interaction network, again, is completely different. So the number of, of agents you interact with uh, evolves in time as well. So I hope uh, I answered to the question. Please tell me if you, uh, you need more clarification. But uh, if not, uh, I was saying there are some keywords like a consensus representing when all agents uh, coalesce to a unique point or opinion. For instance, if we are talking about opinion clustering, as we saw in the Excel Mann Krause, when you have uh, a finite number of uh, uh, points where all agents will um, converge. And more generally, self-organization means, uh, again, this is stemming out of uh, the whole group structure from simple interaction rules. Uh, let me show you for fun uh, what you can play around, for instance, uh, for animal group. Uh, there are a lot of models for animal groups, depending on the animals, uh, the situation. There are animals, again, that move mostly in 2D or 3D, animals on ground, on air, uh, on water. But uh, most of the uh, mathematical models that were proposed are based on few ingredients. Among those ingredients, you can uh, identify usually at least uh, two forces or social forces. Uh, one is repulsion. Well, the animals don't want to hit each other. Uh, that we indicate with an R. One is cohesion. And uh, this is the animals want to stay together again for migration, uh, escaping predators, food, uh, or other reasons. And uh, then it's important also their visual field. Different animals have very different visual field. So in a recent model, we, well, kind of recent model, we played around with these three ingredients, repulsion, cohesion, and total vision. And uh, let me show you what happens, for instance, when you uh, put uh, repulsion more important to cohesion, and you assume that there is a visual field that is uh, you know, close to 30, 60 degrees. Then even starting from a random position, you quite quickly converge to this uh, crystal-like structure where you notice that every neighbor has usually six neighbor. Uh, and uh, there are animals that are known to take this behavior. For instance, uh, well, in a 3D version, uh, starlings uh, form very large flocks uh, with the crystal-like structures. You can find in internet a lot of movies or clips on murmuration. That is this phenomenon in which they get together and they dance, they move in space, they are pretty spectacular. And uh, they have found groups up to millions of birds. And another example are surface cutters like ducks or other uh, aquatic uh, birds. And it's pretty impressive to see from this image a case in which uh, you see, if you count the neighbors are, are very similar to six, the number of neighbors. Then we played around and we said, okay, let's take the situation in which we take a fr mostly frontal vision and uh, cohesion is most important, the repulsion. Uh, this is also linked to the speed of the animal. You see, those guys like the starlings that travel in space, uh, they can be pretty fast. And uh, avoiding uh, um, conflictual trajectory is extremely important. So it makes sense that... Uh, repulsion is stronger than cohesion. You may have a situation in which animals move on land and they don't go so fast, not necessarily, and then maybe cohesion could be more important than repulsion, and we assume to have a frontal vision. So if you start again from random initial data, you see you are going to start forming essentially some lines. And uh, these behavior are observed in various animals, including migrating elephants, but also uh, on migrating lobsters. The lobsters usually form uh, huge chains on the ground of the ocean, and they walk really one after the other. 
Well, I have to say that uh, there is a little bit of trick here. What I mean is that uh, the biology enters uh, pretty strongly. And uh, I don't know if, I mean, from this picture, you cannot notice too much, but essentially uh, the cubs uh, tend uh, to hold the tail of the adult. And also in the case of the lobsters, one essentially is attached to the other. So you see, in this case, there are even more physical bonds that created those lanes. But uh, we were able to recreate uh, using this basic forces. Uh, then uh, we played around with uh, assuming that uh, cohesion and repulsion are kind of in equilibrium, uh, but you have a strong front repulsion. Like, uh, you know, if you are moving in one direction, you don't want uh, anyone in front of you. You don't care if uh, some other animals will be on the side. And as you can notice here, you have a formation of uh, echelons, J's, V's, uh, and obviously this is one of the most uh, uh, common examples of uh, uh, formation done by migrating birds. So sometimes they do some perfect V's, like in this picture of Canadian geese, uh, but sometimes they do echelon-like or J-like structure. You see one leg could be much less than the other or, or even not being there. And uh, these are cranes, by the way, this picture. But uh, you, you observe all of them usually. These, uh, they occur sometimes, but much more often they, you observe J's echelon and other maybe W's or something like that. So you see, that was just one example of how you can play around with these ingredients of uh, um, social dynamics and really create a lot of different self-organization of the group. Uh, this again was focused on animal. The, the interesting thing about animal is that they have a, a really, really wide variety of behavior and wide variety of situations in which it's, it's understandable that these forces may play different roles. Um, if you're curious about the model generating all this picture, uh, yeah, I was saying a, a recent model, but now when I looked back, it was 2011. So I guess we cannot say too recent model, a kind of recent model. Uh, let me move on and talk a little bit about the opposite scale. So up to now, we saw systems that behave like traffic or have some relationship with vehicular traffic and with a microscopic uh, models of vehicular traffic. Again, uh, this uh, uh, alignment model resemble a bit what we see in follow the leader, and so this migration model as well. But on the opposite scale, uh, we can look at traffic uh, as a flow system. So, like, uh, you know, it's, we don't distinguish car by car, but rather there is, uh, we imagine it's almost like a fluid that run on a road or even on a network. So if we uh, assume that it, this is a, a little bit like a fluid on a network, then there are a lot of systems that share some uh, uh, common features. And in particular, essentially almost all of these systems can be described by fluid dynamic equations and even more specifically conservation or balance laws. Uh, there are obviously systems in which are naturally fluid like a gas pipelines, irrigation channel, blood circulation, systems that are more related to services and supply that may include supply chains and data networks, transportation includes also air traffic management, and finally biomedical. Interesting enough, the vascular stent, it's a, it's a fascinating problem in which you have a, a flow that is the blood flow, and then you have another network-like structure, the stent itself, that obeys other a uh, system of PDEs uh, that uh, are related to the elasticity of, of your um, stand. Now, have another question, Bendero. Sure. Uh, okay, George, please go ahead. Oh, I, I was, I was going to ask a question about the um, animal groupings, but it's okay, we can move sure. on. It's not important. Go ahead. Um, well, I was just going to, so could you go back two slides, please? Yep. So I was just wondering, so it, yeah, it's so in this slide, it's, it looks like you're sort of exploring for some different models. What are the, um, what are the equilibria that these models sort of transition to over time? Is it, I guess I had two questions. So one, is it difficult to write analytically what you would expect some of these equilibria conditions to be by looking at the model? And two, did you, are there any of these um, sort of phenomena you see that have interesting um, sort of periodic behaviors rather than sort of clean equilibria? 
Uh, yeah, as usual, George, very interesting questions. So, uh, first of all, uh, proving that uh, those are equilibrium and the convergence uh, is, uh, is a matter that depends on the system or even the equilibria. For instance, uh, formation of uh, the cluster, uh, the sorry, crystal like structures in 2D easy. You, you can prove it. And even, I can tell you even more. We can even let the agents interact just one with one another and still get some of those equilibria and convergence. Uh, these are extremely difficult. <laughs> so people started to come up with so many different explanations for formation of these, uh, including aerodynamic one, aerodynamic advantage. There is a very robust line of research and even experiments about that. And they came up uh, of uh, explanation all the way to mating uh, roles within the same group and even location of the fovea within uh, the animal eye. So you see, the V is uh, way more difficult to do anything analytically or even really proving that uh, those are uh, the natural equilibrium and they, they form. Well, let me say that there are obviously mathematical reasons beyond that. The crystal-like structure is extremely regular, and you would expect that mathematically it's easier to obtain them, and they are more robust. The Vs are pretty singular. And again, many people refer to the Vs, but even when you look at data, most of the time birds behave like these cranes. They, they, don't, you know, they don't even have a perception if you are, they are forming a perfect V or not. So it's really more like, uh, say, structures that are composed by piece of lines. For answering your other uh, question about uh, uh, if you have a more rich phenomena, so we do have a very rich phenomena when we move the, to the opinion dynamics on the sphere. There, as I briefly mentioned, we were able to detect uh, uh, a lot of interesting uh, uh, new type of equilibria, including what we call dancing equilibria. A again, essentially, you pick up a number of agents on the sphere, and you fix them to the sphere, and then you rotate the sphere if you want. And you generate a motion in this way, in which each agent has the same position with respect to the other in a rigid reference, uh, in their own reference, sorry, but uh, the whole system rotates or moves around. And we had the transition from one to another, so a lot of, of uh, funny things. Uh, if you want, I can share some publication where we, we collected some funny behavior. Another way to go is uh, to include the repulsion among agents. So in the opinion dynamics, if you do attraction, but also repulsion, some agents attract, some repel, then you have also very rich phenomena. Uh, the ones in which you know are more trivial, like uh, consensus or clustering, usually is because you just put attraction to play, no other force and you bound yourself to a simple, I mean, uh, topologically simple space. Good answer. Thank you. Okay, so I guess that was uh, uh, a yes. And uh, so let me go back and go to the other scale. So I was saying that uh, if we look at the macroscopic scale, then we have a lot of uh, uh, systems that uh, uh, resemble um, traffic in the sense that share some common properties. Now, interesting enough, I was commenting in the more uh, real fluid systems like gas pipelines, irrigation channel, blood circulation. It's interesting to notice that uh, even in this case, they have uh, very different physics. Uh, irrigation channels have an open uh, um, side. So essentially, you have uh, two ways in which the water interacts with surfaces, either with I mean, with the uh, channel bed and with air. And obviously the physics of these two interactions are, are very different. In gas pipelines, uh, you have only interaction with the, um, uh, with the pipeline boundary. And in uh, blood circulation, well, they are like pipes, uh, but uh, the big difference is that uh, they are very elastic. Uh, and so that's why we are alive, right? Because our vessels are very elastic. So as the blood flows, they modify a lot something that doesn't happen obviously in gas pipelines. So there is a lot of, there are some relationships, but also very different um, physics. And uh, the models, mostly PDE that were developed here are, you know, many. 
Uh, obviously, again, uh, this depends also on the physics. Uh, if you do irrigation channel, most likely you will end up using some banana equation. If you do blood circulation, you will likely go all the way to Navier-Stokes and so on and so forth. So many different type of equations depending on the physics and also many different types of conditions at the junctions. In vehicular traffic, there are a lot of work starting with uh, uh, Lebac, uh, Holden Risebro, and a little bit my group. Um, the conditions you find in blood circulation are completely different. They are based usually on reasoning uh, of the, the same uh, uh, pressure and sometimes energy ends into that. And uh, Supply chains, many times people put buffers in front of links. So many different systems, but somehow related one to the other. Uh, let me go back and talk uh, more, a little bit more extensively about scales. Now, one of the uh, main physical examples in which many of the scales were used is gas dynamics. And in gas dynamics, you have at least uh, three main scales. The microscopic one, in which you may assume that particles behave, you know, here I put down a, a calculus melt up equation. Obviously particles are doing something different, but you may imagine that, that there are Newton type equations for the particles driven by various forces. Uh, then there is at least another scale called usually mesoscopic in which you look at the distribution, probability distribution in time, space and speed of your particle. So for every time and every location space and every speed, you will have a given probability of having a particle with that speed in that location in time and space. If you do that, there are different families of equation you can write. Uh, some families of equation are called mean field. They are PDEs, transport type, like this equation you see here. Some other are Boltzmann-like in which you have uh, terms interacting, uh, taking into account the interaction of particles. If we have time, I will uh, touch base a little bit about uh, the differences between uh, these two, if you want, families of uh, models, sometimes are also called kinetic models. And uh, a more, even more uh, upper, I mean, higher level scale is the, the macroscopic one in which you typically end up with uh, PDEs of different type, like conservation laws. This is exactly like the LWR Paula was talking about. And there you look at the microscopic uh, quantity and the row may represent, as we said before, the density of cards at a given time in a given location. So there are some connections between these uh, scales, uh, like you can pass from one to the other and from the second to the third. And usually you use uh, mean field approaches or averaging approaches. So as you can imagine, you passing from one to the other, you send the number of particles to infinity and you can hope formally to derive an equation of this type. And similarly here, you may average in the V variable and hope to obtain an equation of this type. There, are a, there is a huge mathematical and physical literature on all that with uh, many results and even more open problems. So I will not even attempt <laughs> to, to tell all that story, but I want to tell you just one thing that uh, is uh, interesting a lot to me and uh, I'm uh, working on. That is the idea that you have a common language that is multi-scale and uh, allows also to somehow encompass a little bit part of this approach. Um, to do that, you needed to transition to a slightly more complicated mathematical language, the one of measures. I will not attempt to introduce measures in its generality, but let me just tell you that measures generalize functions and allows you essentially to take into account at the same time some part of the system that behaves like a continuous distribution and some part of the system that behaves like uh, points or hard spheres molecules, agents. So you can mix the two together in this language of measures. For those uh, ones that uh, know a little bit more of the math side, uh, you have an absolutely continuous part that would represent so LP functions or you know, other functions in other spaces. And at the same time, Dirac masses that do represent the concentration masses or microscopic scale. The interesting point is that you write even simpler equation and a unique equation like this could encompass a microscopic scale, a macroscopic scale, or even a mixture of scales. So there is a price to pay, go to a more complicated mathematical language, 
but there are some advantages like uh, mixing scales. And I will provide an example uh, to hopefully convince you that it's, uh, it's, it's worth going to this uh, higher level of generality. As usual, you know, you introduce a higher level of generality to make things appear simpler. I say appear because obviously you pay the price on having the basic objects to be more complicated. So let me show you other example of uh, self-organization and referring to pedestrians. So there are a lot of known phenomena for pedestrians like uh, in, uh, you know, crossing flows and uh, at uh, pedestrian crossings. And interesting enough, if you use mixed scales here, this is a model you see which mix a continuous part, the orange and the blue, and single particles, the, well, I would say red and green. And uh, you see that uh, this uh, simulation represents what you would expect at a uh, pedestrian crossing. So there are two flows that are opposite one to the other. And you see that a little by little, they will tend to organize in lanes uh, flowing from one direction to another. And this is exactly, uh, well, exactly, more or less what you observe at pedestrian crossing. If you let the system evolve for some time, then you will see a clear lane forming going in one direction or another one. There is, a, uh, I have to be honest, sometimes you can get this behavior even just using the microscopic or the macroscopic scale alone. But the multi-scale reproduce more robustly this phenomenon. Another phenomenon that is pretty well known is when you have opposite flows that are sharing a narrow passage, like a revolving door or something like that. Well, not a, a not a revolving door. Uh, then you may observe phenomena like this that are reproduced by a multi-scale situation. You have that uh, initially someone pass and then it forms a kind of traffic light. First, uh, some people in one direction are able to pass, then some people on the other direction, then on the first direction again. So there is a kind of alternating flow between one and the other direction. And this is uh, known as the traffic light effect. Because you see, there is no traffic light at the door but still uh, people end up behaving like if there was a traffic light. First one flow passes for some time, then there is probably enough pressure for reversing that and then some flow pass on the other side and so on and so forth. If you are curious about these models, and we published a book uh, again, 2014. So now it starts to be not yesterday. And uh, the best part of the book by far is the cover. So this cover was designed sharing, uh, you know, uh, some impressions with the graphic designer. So we wanted to give the idea of uh, multi-scale because really we are mixing the scale and uh, the pedestrians. So they came up with very nice, uh, well, I hope you like as I do, but you see there are, the idea is that there are many pedestrians and many different scales and that was the final result of the cover. Uh, there you find really, a, a, it, it's a book written for large audiences. So we start with the first, a third of the book in which we talk about phenomenology. And we, we, we essentially were able to write it without any formula. We were kind of proud of that because that book uh, we hope uh, may interest also researchers from different areas all the way to psychology or areas where you know the math modeling could be less of a, of a standard and uh, and then there are obviously then sections devoted to mathematical modeling uh, simulation and all all what comes with that so oh sorry and again the movie so i will uh, the, this uh, I prepared almost five parts, and I'm happy to see that we just finished just the first. But again, we have no obligation to go through any of those. Uh, but uh, up to now was uh, essentially sharing information about what I know on uh, all these uh, fields uh, that are connected to traffic uh, uh, by means of having uh, addressing similar problems. Um, again, it's, uh, it was like a bird eye view and uh, it was absolutely not exhaustive, but the message is, uh, you see, whatever scale you look at, there are other systems beyond traffic that have similar behavior. So it's, it's very interesting to see the percolation of information between different fields. Uh, I will transition now uh, to the second part that is going to be uh, somehow more technical. 
And I will focus on, okay, now you, you can model the system, you can observe them, but uh, can you do something more? And something more for me means, uh, for instance, controlling them. And uh, I will essentially not uh, try to be exhaustive, but provide uh, two examples. Uh, one example is going to be on the Kakaras mail. So let me bring back the Kakaras mail model written in, a, in even larger letters, so it's more visible. Uh, so the models prescribe alignment. So you see, you have agent i whose position x i, uh, the derivative of the position is vi the speed, the derivative of speed is this interaction term, big N is the number of agents. This term vj minus vi tells you that uh, uh, birds or whatever agent you wanna consider tend to align their speed by interacting with each other. And this term says that uh, the interaction strength depends on the distance. I don't align my speed to birds that are very far away, but I would rather align with birds that are closer to myself. Uh, the result you would expect is a consensus or flocking. So even the word alignment sometimes is used. Uh, so the final result you expect is this. They are traveling all towards uh, the same direction at the same speed. So the original paper of Cocker and Smale, uh, by the way, I don't know if you know, but Smale is, uh, got even a field medal back in the 70s. And then uh, did this very, very interesting uh, person, Steven Smale. You can find a lot of extremely interesting papers by him. And uh, uh, so they wrote this model back in 2007. And you see, they first used a specific uh, um, expression for the interaction functional A. So here A goes like, uh, a little bit like in gravitation if you want, is divided by uh, the distance uh, uh, square, but is likely you know, modified here. You have a one plus, so you don't have any problems even if uh, two agents coincide. And there is a further exponent beta here. So you know, in gravitation, obviously masses interact uh, and the interaction decays as uh, the distance square. Now, uh, they proved quite a bit of things. In particular, they proved that one half is a critical exponent in the following sense. Uh, when beta is below one half, uh, whatever initial condition you put your agents on, they will always converge to consensus or flocking or alignment. So they will align their speed independently of where they start and with which speed. If beta is greater than one half, uh, then convergence uh, starts to depend uh, on uh, how they are positioned in space if they are far away, they are closer, and how um, strong is the interaction potential. Uh, sorry, and uh, how f different is their speed. The interaction potential, sorry, is fixed uh, just by this speed. Again, even just on the Cocker's mail, huge literature. Let me touch base very quickly on some results. Uh, again, a consensus or flocking, uh, it requires uh, conditions or initial, uh, some uh, assumption initial condition for beta greater than one half already in the Cochrane's mail. Then obviously people design these uh, models passing to the limit, kinetic and hydrodynamic, in particular, Hart Tatmor wrote a seminal paper that many other followed. Motion Tidemore proposed an interesting uh, asymmetric definition of this model that is now more popular even than the original Kakaris male. And uh, it doesn't change much, but uh, um, essentially it, it captures a bit better probably how the interaction should be. This is really a very, very symmetric original model. And then there are a lot of other uh, models. The hydrodynamic limit of the Mosch-Tadder model was done by Carper, Mellet, Triviza, uh, and you know, uh, many, many other. Interesting enough, if you wanna cite everyone in the particle system, is you're gonna <laughs> explode because there are people in physics, in biology, in computer science that contributed. In the more mathematical side, you have a lot of important people, the Gong, Carillo, Jorge, Fornazir, Batozzi, Toscani, Figali, Vesil, Slepchev, just to mention a few that provided uh, a number of interesting results. Now, our uh, interest now is control. So our idea is that uh, we, you are gonna able to act uh, on the agents by modifying their acceleration. So we heard a lot about autonomous vehicles in autonomous vehicle, we assume that we can control the acceleration. And similarly here, we assume you can control the acceleration of some of these agents. 
uh, if we are talking about control, well, most of what I will say are work done with Caponegro for Nazir, Rossi, and Trella. And uh, obviously, we were building up on very robust uh, uh, consensus and alignment and other work that was done for control of, uh, of robot groups. And there you have a lot of names that contributed uh, uh, to that. Uh, there is one beautiful paper by Mario Fati Cyber uh, that I, I would definitely suggest to look at about consensus systems. Uh, Naomi Leonard already mentioned did a lot of interesting work and, and many others. Uh, the dots are there means a lot, a long list. So let me tell you what you can do to uh, control the Kakaras mail system. Assuming for instance that the system by itself would not naturally uh, converge to alignment. Uh, now we start with a little bit of math annotation. So there are, first of all, uh, this consensus space you should introduce. So if you have N agents in RD, so altogether they live in RDN, what you want to drive the system towards uh, is uh, all equal speed. So this is a subset of your uh, state space. You want all agents have the same speed. And V orthogonal is just the orthogonal space. Then you can introduce important functional. B is just a general definition of bilinear form. But the interesting objects are X and V. X essentially measures how much sparse in space is your system. You see, I sum up the square of the distances among all agents. And then I normalize by some constant. And you can do the same for speeds. So essentially, X tells me how much my agents are sparsely distributed in space. And V is telling me how sparsely I distributed my agents in speed. And uh, interesting enough, uh, for the general Kakaras main model, you can understand immediately if the system is going to converge to alignment or not in a mathematically very clean way. So the only thing you need to do for a general function, and not only the original Kakaras main, is the following. You look at the initial sparsity in space. You look at the initial sparsity in speed. And then you do this computation. You compare these quantities. The quantity on the left uh, essentially measure how much still the agents will interact, even if they will uh, you know, run away towards infinity at different speed. So it's the integral between the square root of the sparsity in space plus infinity. And you see here is your interaction functional A. And you know, if there are some quantity here, some constant, but the, well, number of agents, the square root of two, but essentially this quantity tells you that is uh, how much more interaction you can play with to align the agents. And here is the sparsity in speed. So essentially you need, uh, you know, the more the agents are closer, the bigger is this integral because the smaller is this quantity. And the more sparse, the smaller is this. And the same is with V. So essentially, what it's telling you is that uh, your sparsity in space should be small enough so that uh, the future to be interaction dominates the sparsity in speed. And this is extremely simple, is for any general A. And uh, this condition is sufficient to tend to consensus and is almost necessary. What do I mean by almost necessary is the following. Uh, whenever you have a this inequality, you converge to consensus. Whenever you, you have a strict inequality, you provide initial conditions uh, so that uh, some will, will not tend uh, to consensus. And when you are on the boundary, numerically, you can study that. And almost always, uh, uh, you will, uh, 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 when you get close to the boundary, you will achieve your result. So essentially, it's, it's a kind of optimal condition even if we cannot prove uh, analytically the necessary condition, but it, it's definitely sufficient. Uh, now, to control that, well, there are some trivial things you can say immediately. If you just move all agents uh, towards, uh, you know, in a, or I mean, using a speeds uh, acceleration in this uh, space so that moving towards consensus, you will just go to consensus. Obviously, in infinite time, because the more you get closer, the more you are using smaller controllers. So the control problem is completely trivial if you can control all agents. Just move in the right direction, that's it. And you don't even need bigger controls, whatever. Obviously, the bigger the control is, the faster you will converge, but nothing more than that. 
But if you want to uh, control just a small number of agents, uh, then uh, the situation becomes uh, more complicated. And one approach could be the following. Instead of uh, minimizing just this uh, looking control that minimize just this piece would be as before, just driving towards, uh, your to uh, towards the consensus space. But you add something here that is uh, a new term on what you want to optimize. And this contains uh, this gamma that was in the slide before that essentially tells you you are or you are not already in consensus. And then uh, this is a so-called L1, L2 norm. So I sum up overall legends some quantity, and this is called small L1, but then I put here the L2 norm of your control. So in one word here, I'm essentially at the same time trying to minimize the amount of control I use for every agent, and also amount how many con agents I control, because it's known that when you use the L1 norm, like of this type, the optimizer will tend to use just a small number of uh, agents at the same time. So this term will push your control just to con act on a small number of agents uh, at every single time. And we can prove a various result. And now there is some technicality here because what happens that is this uh, is not single valued in general. Depending on uh, the points in the space, you may be multi-valued. So if this is not a single solution, it's multi-value, what you get is really not a feedback control, but rather a differential inclusion. And so you needed to look at the differential inclusion, but still we can prove that all solution converge to consensus. And if you insist on a feedback, you can sample from this set of optimal of good controls. And for instance, lexicographically and so on, the price to pay there is that it's ex very wildly discontinuous. And then you need to interpret the solution. And there are various concepts like a sample and hold solution limit. Uh, this is very natural. Essentially, you have a very discontinuous feedback. So you sample it, you keep it constant for some time, and then you resample. And when you have the sufficiently small sampling time, then you still converge to consensus. And uh, you always inter uh, uh, act on one agent at the time. And uh, by the way, you can prove that you, minima you maximize the decrease of your natural Yapuno function that is this functional V measuring uh, sparsity in space. So essentially, the message is uh, you can do a lot of things. And uh, you can do also by controlling a small number of agents. Now, uh, my next example was uh, the traffic control, but... Uh, I fear that you saw this movie so many times that now maybe you're a bit sick of seeing them again. <laughs> but, you know, uh, essentially, you know, there was a, this big project that we worked out with the then work, Benny Siebold and Jonathan Springle, that we are very proud of. So if you let us uh, talk more, we will talk about this all the time. So uh, just let me repeat very quickly, but uh, there are... The waves that form ubiquitously. This is the famous Tsujiyama experiment. And uh, there are waves forming. And then we had uh, this project uh, with uh, Dan, Benny, and Jonathan, in which we were able to dissipate uh, this, uh, uh, these waves um, using one single autonomous vehicle in the same setting of the Tsujiyama experiment. Uh, and the result was uh, uh, quite a nice result. I mean, let me go ahead here in terms of a reduction in fuel consumption, uh, uh, velocity, standard deviation, and braking events. Uh, I will not insist much because I expect everyone by, knows almost by heart this movie by now and <laughs> all, the, all the quantities, but essentially you see, uh, it's not very different uh, um, in the spirit from uh, this type of approaches like in the Cockerous Mail in which you want to act on a very small number um, of agents and try to drive the whole system to a behavior. In the case of Cockerell's mail would be to align all the agents. And in this case uh, was, uh, well, essentially align all the agents in the sense that we wanted all the cars to go with the same speed and that would eliminate the waves as, as a intended consequence, uh, reduce fuel consumptions, breaking event and so on. Uh, but uh, the spirit is the same. You try to drive the system towards a certain behavior and you want to do it uh, acting on a small number of agents. 
Now, the biggest difference between what we achieved in this, uh, uh, in this experiment and this project and what uh, uh, we were designing more theoretically for the Cockroach male model is the following. Here, we have one autonomous vehicle, only one. And we cannot decide to act first on that and then on another car. We can act all the time just precisely on that autonomous vehicle. We can, not only we can act just on one vehicle at a time, but we can act just on that vehicle, nothing else. While uh, in many of these control results for Cochrane's mail and other system, we allow ourselves to act on any agent of the system and uh, just one at a time. Obviously, uh, it depends on the application, uh, if it makes sense one approach on the other, in this case, you know, we had no choice. We had one autonomous vehicle and we were very lucky to have one. And so we have no choice. We have to find control strategies just by acting on that specific one. If you're thinking about uh, opinion formation or other model, it could be that you could act on a small number of agents, but not necessarily fixed ones. If you want to persuade a group to do something, you could just start persuade one person and then another one and then another one, maybe acting one at a time, but choosing who you're acting upon. So it really depends on your application. If it makes sense to assume uh, that you can control one agent at a time, but any agent, or you can control one agent full stop. Um, so we are now going into the deep woods of Minfield and so on. So before we dare doing that, I would like uh, to ask if there are questions. So what yeah, there is actually from, from George. Uh, let me just uh, unmute him. Back. Okay, George, go ahead. So I had a question. It, I, I noticed that the, um, the Cucker Smale model looks pretty similar in structure to some of these optimal velocity models that we use for microscopic modeling in terms of sort of like there's an optimal velocity that it moves to and it looks at other um, agents to determine its equilibria. Do you, but, that it, but that rather than just looking at one vehicle ahead, maybe you know, it looks at all other agents. Do you think there are any interesting sort of implications or phenomena that we might see if we were to try and adopt something like the Cucker Smale, but to use it in a context where maybe it looks at, at some other section of other vehicles in the flow around it? as opposed to just the one ahead of it. So maybe like a, like a multi-vehicle following algorithm that it would have some of these interesting, do you think you could take lessons learned from that setting and turn them into things we might be able to use for traffic? Absolutely. So uh, indeed, uh, George is also part of another big project on which we are working together with Dan and so on. And that's exactly what our subgroup in that project is doing and will probably present on Monday. So it's uh, absolutely uh, looking uh, inspired by Kakaris mail, you could assume that you look a few cars ahead. Now, I don't pretend that this is technologically possible. There are a lot of questions that could stem up there. Uh, like, uh, you know, um, vehicle to vehicle communication could be one thing or other type of radar system could allow some information of a more vehicle ahead, not just one. Uh, but in any case, uh, it's definitely interesting to explore, and you could mimic a little bit what you do in Cacker's Mail. Uh, now, notice that uh, in Cacker's Mail, all agents interact with each other, essentially, or you could use bounded confidence to do a subset, but the control still uh, acts just on one agent at a time. In the Cacker's Mail example, we were essentially using the information on the whole group. Uh, while in the traffic uh, experiment, we are using the information just on the same agent and the headway, so essentially one agent ahead. So it's interesting to explore this intermediate situation in which uh, we will use information of few vehicle ahead. So it's intermediate between using just the information of your vehicle, speed and distance to next vehicle, and the information of few vehicles or even global information. These are three different level of controls, right? That you can even put hierarchical. And uh, if you want, even when we were designing the experiment in Arizona, we were thinking a little bit hierarchical because even the control itself contained pieces that were related to safety. And that is more lower level control. Like you, wanna, you don't want to crash. 
And believe me, it was really a true possibility when we run the experiment, so we had to be careful. A second level controller is, uh, well, you try to uniform the speed. And the third level controller, uh, in that specific uh, uh, video, uh, we change the target speed uh, um, in different uh, phase of the experiment. And the target speed worked uh, like we had our supervisory control whose name were Benny and uh, Jonathan, that were looking at the system and suggesting the speed uh, to Rahul that was on board of the car and adjusting the speed. So it's, it's, it was like mimicking a supervisory control in which you could have information from the infrastructure about the appropriate speed to target, and then that could be passed to the, to the AV that would then use that information for, for the longitudinal control. So there are a lot of different possibilities and definitely it's, it's interesting to explore the, uh, the similitudes, similarities among different uh, systems. Let me just add one thing. Uh, most of the time, uh, uh, the Kakar mail is used in two dimension or three dimension. And obviously it's, it's, it's very different, the behavior of systems with agents traveling in 2D or in 1D as, as obvious. I think Benny is raising the hand, maybe he has more specification about what I said of uh, the experiment or? Yeah, I'm jumping the line, Sharon obviously raised her hand before, but I wanted to quickly comment that uh, one thing that is um, a key difference between traffic flow and many other systems uh, that you see with birds or, or animals is the bidirectionality versus unidirectionality. Uh, so in traffic flow, usually you adapt to what happens ahead of you, uh, but not behind you. Whereas in most of these carcass mail models, there's some kind of bidirectional information exchange. Um, and that can actually make a huge difference potentially on, on how information flows and how things adapt. Um, which of course could mean when you think of connected vehicles and vehicle connectivity, whether upstream flow of information that one could potentially consider adding uh, could actually really affect the dynamics in some fundamental and interesting ways. If I can interject, interesting enough, the animals have all of that and not. What I mean is that, for instance, in elephant, you almost are like in a traffic situation. They are aligned and you see just in front. So just to say that uh, you are perfectly right, Kakaras may assume total uh, an anisotropy of, uh, of agents. So, you know, it's a perfectly parallel. But in, in animal application, people did consider mm -hmm. quite a few times the, the fact that animals have a, a front of at least some animal distinguish front and rear, and uh, I was talking about the visual field that that is similar to what happens in traffic, but mm -hmm. definitely. So one, one question from Sharon. Yeah. So Sharon. Oh, thank you. Um, so you also mentioned uh, many other social dy dynamics models um, other than uh, Cogger's males. So uh, probably it's also aligned with the first question you try, you answered. So uh, what, how do we select which model we can use for, for traffic dynamics? Uh, so, well, uh, let me try to interpret the question in this way. Uh, we saw during these couple of weeks a lot of uh, traffic models, right? And uh, follow the leader, Bando, IDM, and so on. Uh, so there has been already a lot of effort in designing appropriate uh, models for traffic. So I don't want to give the message that uh, uh, we should uh, replace follow the leader by Kakaras mail or anything like that. Those models were designed by people that had a lot of experience with data, engineering experience, physics, math. Anyway, they poured a lot of uh, knowledge into designing those models. And so those models are usually well performing for traffic. Each one has advantages and disadvantages like every model, but they were designed by experts. So I would say that definitely, if you need to choose a model, I would suggest to start with the ones that were designed for traffic. Uh, my message was more of the type, uh, uh, it's interesting to notice that there are a lot of different systems uh, that uh, and models that were designed for different realities, ranging from opinion to again, Kakaras male originally language, animal groups, pedestrians, and so on. And so, it's uh, it's a good idea to take advantage of the fact that uh, there are so many good minds that were put at work on all the different models. So each different groups may come up uh, with a different idea on how to address the problem and you could have some portability of these ideas from one example to another. 
But obviously, you have important differences, like uh, Benny uh, underscored, and like I hope I gave the impression. So, you know, I, I wouldn't uh, force uh, uh, the use of one of these models for traffic necessarily, but I do think that some ideas could percolate from field to field. Does it answer your question? Um, yeah, but why did you specifically only talk about the progress now? Uh, uh, sorry, the question is why I chose to talk about the cockroach mail? Yeah. Oh, in this specific, well, if I can correct, I talked also about traffic by showing the movie, right? So, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, so I wanted to present two examples. There are control results for many of the systems I talked about. And there are even uh, results, experiment, and so on. Uh, in animal groups, uh, people did uh, experiment inserting some robots within animal groups. So there are, uh, you know, it's, when you give a tutorial, you need to make uh, very hard choices. So my choice here was after giving a general idea of uh, the models, Again, a general idea because it's very far from being exhaustive, but pointing towards some directions. My idea was to give two examples of uh, control results that can say something. But uh, there is also there a body of work for many of these uh, different systems. But it would be you know, impossible to try to present control results for all of those different systems. I don't know if you have follow up or uh, we can. Uh, how many more minutes, Monty, do I have? So you have about eight minutes, but it is, um, you know, it's it's really your time constrained that uh, that we worry about. But if you if you can speak more, you see, I didn't even speak more. Ben is already raising his hand. <laughs> ben, <laughs> let me unmute Benny. All right, so, so, so here's an actual question that I'm really interested in. So um, in these non-traffic flow applications, um, essentially all these mathematical results assume that the model remains fixed um, and is known uh, and is given. And then what is the corresponding control? Um, in, in human, of course, at some point, if somebody behaves completely out of the norm or crazily or something, you will stop following to your normal behavior and change your behavior. Um, I would expect that some of these aspects be present in animals uh, as well, yet that is probably really hard to study and understand and so on. So it's sort of a two-part question. First of all, how much validation is actually for these models in a principled way, right? Uh, just the fact that they produce a certain pattern doesn't, doesn't mean that they do it for the right reason, for example. And the second question, has that aspect ever been considered in the context of control uh, when you talk about animals? Okay, uh, so as usual, interesting question. Let me uh, try to answer um, uh, distinguishing clearly uh, the pedestrian dynamics uh, with the animal groups. Mm -hmm. Because those are, you know, they share similarities, but uh, as fields, uh, they are very different for all, one each other for good reasons. Uh, now, for what concerns uh, uh, mathematical results, as you can imagine, it's easier, right? Uh, what I mean is that we can create models just with our blackboard. So right. that is, uh, th there is, that's why there is a big proliferation. And the same is for computer simulations. So experiments uh, for models in the sense of designing models and uh, doing computer experiments, definitely a lot. And uh, if I can comment about the different behavior, definitely. There is uh, a buzzword, panic, that is used for pedestrians. So many of these pedestrian models were built exactly to understand the risks uh, when there are large events uh, and stampedes or anyway in panic situation. So there is a quite reasonable literature uh, discussing panic. Um, but I would say that uh, a lot remained at the level of uh, qualitative discussion and a little bit quantitative. This is my personal opinion. Uh, but typically what you could imagine is that the agents behave, have an internal state uh, so that when it's a normal behavior, it I mean, it behaves in a certain way and then it switches to panic depending usually on the behavior of the neighbor and so on and so forth. There is a reasonable amount of models having this type of uh, logic variable switch, if you want. So internal state that change. Sometimes you can call this uh, nanoscopic dynamics, right? 
That is when uh, you open the particle and you look inside, you put the dynamics inside the particle. In traffic, it would be like when you include a lot of the car internal uh, uh, system. And uh, uh, so the, the real, there are literature there. Um, and, uh, but, uh, you know, Dirk Helbin did even experiments. Okay, he claims that with panic. But the experiment was that his lab uh, was, they were told to exit quickly from the room and then they put uh, an obstacle in front of the room and there is this uh, famous uh, Bryce paradox that uh, it will improve uh, the flow because people will not gather at the exit and get stuck there. Uh, but, you know, I saw the movies, uh, I, I mean, I, I wrote even a couple of papers with Dirk. I saw the movies, you know, it's extremely difficult to really reproduce the panic situation in an experiment. It's already extremely difficult to, to do experiments with humans. Uh, let me tell you just that. Uh, in the book, you will find a little experiment uh, that was funny for us, and is the following. We placed a cone in the middle of uh, a little path in the Rutgers Camden uh, campus. And then we did this experiment. You know, if you put a cone exactly in the middle of the path, what would you expect people to do? Pass right or pass left? Well, you do observe something, uh, uh, you know, pretty expected. Like if you put the cone just behind the turning of the corner, the distribution left to right will depend on Essentially, the physical constraint, because you turn, you see the cone immediately. So, you know, you have some inertia and so on. But then there are the, most, the more interesting psychological bias phenomenon. We did the three settings. You just stop the person and ask the people, would you pass right or left? Or you tell the people, sorry, I will observe you. You are in an experiment. And the third point is just you observe without telling them. Obviously, you have authorization, you know, <laughs> of, of everyone that you can use the camera and so on because they are already informed they are taped. Completely different situation. We put a situation in which uh, uh, it was advantageous to go to the left of the cone, but in the U.S., we keep the right on roads and we keep the right even when we walk. So if you just have a narrow passage, people will tend to, to pass to the right. And, uh, you know, if we have two opposite flaws, you will keep the right. And uh, so the experiment we ran was uh, when people would not be informed, 70% will pass to the left because it was more convenient. When uh, uh, we were just informing that we were observing them, they were split in half and half. And uh, when we would ask uh, on which side would you pass, they would prefer the right by 70, 80%. So this just to tell you that it's difficult to run experiments with pedestrian, let it alone to run experiment in which you assume there is a panic situation. And this type of difficulty then transmits also to animals. With animals, it's very hard to collect the data in general. And so there is a paucity of data, much less than, uh, I would say animal, very little, Pedestrian, a little bit more, not comparable to what we have in traffic. Uh, thanks, Benedetto. I, I have another hand here from George. So go ahead, George. George? Yeah, sorry. Um, so Benny was just asking about um, validation on these models and it sounds like what you were saying is that it, is that depending on how you phrase the problem it can be very very difficult i guess i have the same question but for if there are lessons learned about calibration of these models so you know a lot of them have sort of some parameter that describes something about the system like are there are there sort of coherent ways that are, are there instances of people trying to calibrate these models to data and and then i guess are there um ways that people phrase those problems in a way that makes sense or you know i guess the 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 brute force way to try and match trajectories but perhaps there are more intelligent ways to try and match like you know reduced order model uh quantities like you were talking about the you know rotation of a sphere you might want to do that rather than trying to match all the trajectories are there can you say anything about like how hard the calibration problem is for these uh, yeah so uh again I want to point out that I'm expressing my knowledge. So <laughs> you know, no, don't take me as a guru on all that. But in, uh, for what I know, animals, uh, uh, I would say that people 
again, th there is really paucity of data. And uh, I would say that people uh, tend uh, rather to insert more biological reasoning in the choice of the model and the, uh, and the parameters rather than doing uh, a lot of calibration. And that makes sense from the point of view of saying, you know, uh, you don't have a lot of data, but uh, you have a lot of information about the biology of uh, the agents. So let's pour that information in. So again, uh, it's, it's a short with, with obviously exception for ants. Uh, there are some information, there are groups that made experiment with fishes and others. So, you know, it's not like a general rule. I would say that uh, the field that tends a little bit more in that direction. For what concerns humans, uh, uh, there were experiments uh, and so there were more calibration activity there. Um, again, I, and this I express my very personal opinion, I'm always extremely skeptical in experiments with humans, uh, in pedestrian in particular, when uh, people are informed to be in an experiment. Unfortunately, by direct, uh, you know, small investigation that we did, uh, quite a number of times, this is not that well explored, but it's extremely important. It's uh, by the only fact that you know you are in an experiment, it's very likely for you to behave differently. So I would say it's, it's, it's a hard, very hard problem. And, uh, but it, it's a very nice open field. I don't think there are so many experts in calibration in those areas. So if someone is interested, surely there is space for doing something. So thank you very much, Benedetto. I know that you have a time commitment. Uh, I'm sure that we would love to know more. And I hope we get more chances to know more from you. Um, yeah, I will be happy. Yeah, I will be happy to, and I'm very happy that we stopped the part two because now we were entering the, <laughs> the the dark side of the more math details. So it's uh, it's I think that uh, it's 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 a great balance. And obviously, if uh, someone is interested in the more uh, uh, mean field part, advanced uh, math, uh, connecting scales, we can we can have other chances of interaction. Thank you very much. Truly appreciate it. Thank you.